Guten Tag zu alles. Uh, willkommen zu unseren Gästen. Uh, and uh, I'm switching to English because it's uh, international today. And I'm more than happy really to uh, an honor uh, to be in a position to greet uh, our uh, today's guest lecturer, Professor Hans Jelta, and uh, his uh, wife. Uh, we are very pleased to, to see them uh, in Belgrade uh, finally. And uh, they, they are here for a couple of days. Uh, uh, Professor Gartner yesterday had a lecture at the seminar of the Faculty of Political Sciences, also dealing with neutrality. And today, this is, if I could say, our main event. Uh, uh, he will introduce us uh, uh, to the issues and actually uh, about the, to speak more or less about the position of general idea of neutrality, especially cases of Austria and Serbia in these turbulent times, not to use some other words and so on. Uh, so, uh, I, I hope that you have seen the, the, uh, our small ad, if I could say. Uh, if I would start to speak about the merits and the history of Professor Gartner, it would take quite a lot of time, so I will try to skip it. Uh, just briefly saying that we are really speaking about somebody who is probably one of the best experts neutrality generally, somebody who's been working on this concept theoretically, but also practically. He and his colleagues from the Institute and University have been for a very long time working on the uh, development of documents, uh, uh, which are actually uh, uh, defining, uh, uh, developing and presenting what that concept of neutrality means. Uh, he's been teaching, of course, mentoring uh, uh, people, and even I saw there is one younger guy uh, from Serbia, Serbian guy, Luka Cekic, I think, who is assistant at uh, the institute uh, at which uh, Professor Gerta is engaged. Uh, so, of course, I have to, to uh, thank to our colleague uh, Peter Mutinovic, or Peter Mutinovic, uh, who uh, invited Professor Devo together in uh, Morocco a couple of months ago conference, and we already had a idea, so he just speed it up, and I'm really happy to uh, organize that uh, in a very fast uh, way. Uh, today with us also, I have to uh, just uh, mention, there is a very serious delegation from the Ministry of the De Defense, and I'm very grateful and thankful for them for coming and showing that there is interest, not only academically in Serbia, but also uh, in the practical terms. Uh, uh, here we have uh, uh, Mr. Banic, who is uh, assistant to uh, uh, Minister of Defense, then uh, Mr. Murdoch, and uh, our colleague also, Professor uh, it is Janica uh, Vajic. I, I could say that we are really honored with the level of uh, delegation from the ministry. There are also many colleagues from other institutes who are together with us, uh, and I'm really happy to see that. And uh, uh, if I'm right, we should be having also some people at, Nine. at Nine. Uh, Zoom. How many people? Nine, Nine people there. Uh, if uh, 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 it is at 10 now, I think that uh, His Excellency Mr. Tokac, uh, who is uh, Ambassador of uh, Republic of Ukraine in Serbia, should be with us. So I want to, to greet him as well and say that uh, we are honored uh, with us. And I expect him also, if uh, people uh, and other experts who are following this via Zoom, to participate in discussion. After that, so I already took a lot of time, and I would ask Professor Gatman to introduce us with 45, 50 minutes uh, about the issue, and uh, after that, we will have to speak, speak us. And so I forgot our author, also Ms. Anila Hilatiewicz, who is uh, coming from the uh, Embassy of Switzerland, but also our colleague, not to forget, that somebody who was working on the position for the politics of Serbia nowadays. And one more uh, uh, sentence before I start, just to remind you where we are uh, and why issue of neutrality is of uh, substantial, I would say, living importance for Serbia. Uh, as you all know, in 2007, Serbia has defined its military neutrality, uh, uh, and since that uh, time, uh, when we passed this declaration in uh, 
uh, our assembly. Uh, uh, it has been mentioned in uh, the documents, Ministry of Defense has been uh, uh, introduced in the meantime, but still there is a general sense that we still have to work uh, theoretically and in documents and strategy to develop and define that. Uh, and uh, speaking about the moment in which we are now uh, 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 defining ourselves, uh, there is ongoing war for one and a half year uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there is a big uh, uh, turmoil happening in the Caucasus between Armenia, Armenia and uh, uh, Azerbaijan. And there is unfortunately a new, uh, very dangerous situation in the Middle East. In all three cases, Serbia is trying in practical ways, although it's not very easy, to preserve some kind of uh, equidistance, neutral position, and to preserve as much as it's possible good relationship with both of the parties, understanding what is really going on. So this also, I think, uh, um, justifies our interest for neutrality and trying to see where we are and how we could define ourselves in that position in the future. So, uh, without further ado, thank you very much for coming and please, Professor, uh, for his yours. Vielen Dank für die Einladung und für die netten Worte. Es freut mich sehr, hier zu sein. I'm really glad to be here and thank you for the invitation. And uh, also, uh, only here the, for the second time in Belgrade, it's also good uh, some uh, sightseeing tomorrow. So. Anyway, uh, today I will, I'm supposed to speak uh, about neutrality and the concept uh, of neutrality. Yesterday I spoke uh, before students, and I had a PowerPoint presentation, but usually I do not use a PowerPoint presentation except for uh, the uh, students, because I don't want to be a slave of my own PowerPoint uh, presentation, and I'm much more flexible. We are much more flexible. We speak freely, so uh, don't hesitate also to interrupt me uh, if I'm not clear. And uh, otherwise, I'm supposed to speak. Uh, I'm supposed to speak uh, for 25 minutes. I can do. Yes, uh, but I, I'm also interested uh, for uh, your questions and quick comments. Uh, uh, listening to your uh, experiences here, so I'm not so much from this uh, situation of Serbia, but anyway, here I do the expect. But, uh, I will also speak, uh, beginning to speak a little more about the concept of neutrality and then move on. Historical examples as well, and to current uh, affairs, and the development of uh, idea of uh, of neutrality. I I will start uh, quoting not to the, because it's uh, Austria, but I guess it's one of the best definitions uh, of neutrality. Uh, that's good uh, in a nutshell, uh, tells you what. Uh, Military neutrality, because we're in Serbia, of course, military neutrality. But I'm going to argue that it should go based beyond neutrality. Uh, but it was in 1955 when uh, the Austrian Parliament adopted a law um, about uh, Austrian neutrality. It's a constitutional law. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, parallel Austria accepted the state treaty, which is not enshrined in the legally enshrined uh, The state treaty was uh, signed by the big powers, but the big victory powers after the Second World War. But the victory powers would, of course, not have accepted, signed uh, the state treaty in Austria, accepted the authority, but it was to the benefit uh, of Austria because uh, Austria was divided like Germany. Uh, to 45, uh, uh, after the neutrality law, all foreign soldiers uh, would leave uh, Austrian territory, and Austria would get back its territory and get sovereignty uh, because of neutrality, because it was not involved in either of the blocks, neither Marshall uh, Pact nor NATO, and it was. United after that, uh, in contrast uh, to Germany. 
which remained uh, united, but that compact is uh, as well. So this neutrality law has basically three main uh, features, which, which are still relevant uh, for all types of neutrality. I'm going to talk about several types of neutrality immediately uh, after that. But this neutrality law uh, comprises uh, three main points. Uh, first of all, uh, Austria was not allowed to join any military alliance. I think for me, joining a military alliance with uh, security commitments like that, if I was military, for me, that's the real red line. As, as I'm going to argue, neutrality is a very flexible concept and adapted to our history. Uh, but uh, joining a military alliance with, alliance with uh, security commitments is a red line for, a red line for separate reasons. Um, that is the first condition. The second condition is uh, that the neutral state, in that case Austria, uh, put it more generally, uh, uh, is not allowed to deploy foreign troops permanently on its soil. Of course, they can be. They are attaches, exercises, but having permanent basis uh, uh, is not allowed. The third, which is a little uh, hidden in the neutrality law, because it says um, perman uh, the permanent neutrality. So Austria would not be allowed to participate in foreign wars. I think it's a third condition. Um, the neutrality law speaks of permanent neutrality because permanent means not forever, permanent means also in a peace time. So in peace time, you, the neutral states have, have always to make it clear I'm not going to join foreign wars. Uh, except I'm deferred uh, in the case I'm a debtor of the neutral states. That then, of course, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter uh, uh, would uh, also. Uh, uh, so, no military alliance, no foreign troops, no foreign wars. So, that's uh, basically the three conditions. So, having said this, uh, with my students, we developed or we looked at uh, 21 types of neutrality. So neutrality is not a fixed concept. So uh, as you can imagine, over the time, uh, it is a very old uh, concept and explicitly of neutrality since the 19th century, but in practice it is of course much, much, much older. Uh, so it's not only a child of the Cold War, huh? uh, but some would argue that uh, we don't have a code line to stick with argument because neutrality is much older. So, the latest after 1815, the military uh, neutrality law was enshrined in the week of seven, of course, the Swiss authorities. You, you know that much better than that. So I, I will not go through all the 30 uh, one concepts here, but I mentioned just a few of them. Uh, they are um, most important. So common understanding of neutrality is a type of neutrality that uh, dominated uh, the its uh, century, so we can talk about the occasional neutrality. Occasional neutrality is contrast to the set of permanent neutrality, occasional neutrality just means staying out of a certain war, not participating in a certain war, since we have such as uh, many of them, and uh, this concept of it was limited to non participation. It does not, this requirement doesn't disappear, but it was the main uh, requirement at that time. So that was occasional neutrality. And after 
the new trinity uh, concept after 45, or of course, let's say it, after uh, 1918, after the First World War, uh, uh, developed several variations. And uh, there, of course, uh, Switzerland was uh, uh, the main actor and in Switzerland. Uh, there was the main debate about equality. And there was this uh, Swiss idea of uh, integral neutrality and integral neutrality. Uh, comprehensive neutrality or uh, with all dimensions. So not only military, but also economic, uh, um, uh, cultural, and uh, so and it, it means an equidistance uh, to uh, our all big uh, powers. So uh, it's a kind of isolationist uh, neutrality, and the Swiss called it at some point a sitting still. So. Uh, concepts of keeping out of everything, so this idea. But the Swiss themselves uh, changed uh, the concept after the uh, First World War and the League of Nations, and there was already the debate about sanctions, and uh, so the Swiss interpretation opened up a little bit and uh, talked about the differential neutrality, so more selective neutrality, okay, military, yes. Economically, not so much. Ever since the Swiss, the Swiss oscillated uh, uh, this uh, concept, and we still, we still do this. But uh, the integral neutrality is a kind of the past. It was ne never really ideal. It was never really implemented in the real uh, isolationist uh, isolationist uh, neutrality. But it is as a concept. Yeah, it is differential. We have an occasional integral uh, differential uh, uh, neutrality. Uh, in contrast, uh, Austria had developed this uh, in the 70s with this Chancellor Bruno Kreisky, a different type of neutrality. It was a of an active neutrality. It was very much linked, of course, to this. Uh, specifically uh, personality of this person, but anyway, uh, you, could, you could see the neutrality can be something different, just, just not just staying out of something, but participating. So this idea of what the neutral state should be uh, active, uh, so that was the time when most of the international organizations uh, came to Vienna, of course the IMD, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, was in 1957 uh, uh, already, but because uh, of uh, Austria's neutrality, like in Switzerland, Geneva, was in uh, the uh, institutions, organizations uh, as, uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, but also, we're talking about the Middle East, and it's still uh, relevant. Uh, Kreisky and coming from a neutral state, he was the first uh, statesman who uh, brought the idea of the two-state solution in, before the United Nations. So we have this debate ever since, and it's still there was no solution, uh, but it was coming from a neutral state, this, uh, this, this uh, suggestion. So neutral states can be involved. Also, Kreisky, for example, uh, Suggested the Marshall Plan for the Third World, as it was called at that time, because you know, of course, after the Second World War, especially Germany and Austria benefited from some uh, American money, the investment of the Marshall Plan that the former president suggested. But, uh, so if you suggest somebody something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be cheaper. It's too much. Uh, um, uh, since, um, but uh, we are not in the, but, but of course I should mention, as I mentioned before, so very important also, uh, as it was also from Yugoslavia, uh, where this NA states, neutral non aligned states in the 70s, so, and they were the main facilitators uh, for the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, is like to say, Summit, Helsinki Summit in 75. So, what, and the Helsinki document basically, I think it was the 
best document which you uh, uh, brought, up, uh, brought about uh, since 45. So, and I'm not going to talk about the document now, but the NDA states were relevant, in the, I would call it even indispensable for uh, setting up uh, this conference and this uh, process. Uh, and Yugoslavia was part of it, and Yugoslavia had even more power because Yugoslavia was a leading country, uh, was in the non alliance movement, like what we are missing now, that we have a state in Europe which is neutral and has the same time and uh, influence or standing uh, in the global south. So that's, uh, that that's, uh, was the 70s, and Austria started also to participate slowly in international peace keeping, keep, uh, keeping forces. So that's the same. Now we are not in the 70s anymore, so we are, of course, the uh, right move on. And Austria is member of the European Union, a uh, member of the Partnership for Peace of NATO, uh, peacekeeping uh, operations uh, developed, not enough, in my opinion, so uh, Austria is now reducing its number of peacekeeping forces that we about. Uh, 1,500 uh, at some point, now we are back about less than 1,000. I think it's uh, unfortunate, uh, but it has been one of the uh, I rather think it should go uh, peacekeeping forces, but it not need to, uh, need to uh, decide. But it was also participation in uh, peacekeeping uh, developed uh, over, over time, so it was more visible. Uh, so, and Austria uh, developed this idea of saying, no, 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 sitting still. Neutral states can have a voice. They should raise their voice. If it comes to uh, uh, genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, human, massive human rights violations, war, uh, their neutral states should speak up. But I think speaking up is not enough. It's important when it comes to it. War in Ukraine, it should, because the should have done it, it did not, when it comes to uh, the Middle East situation. Uh, but there is no neutrality of values. There is no neutrality of values. But at the same time, neutral states are supposed to make suggestions. Not necessarily they have to be implemented, they have to be some, some proposal. Otherwise, it's only a confession neutrality. So that's, that's not enough. And I think. Austria is accepting the idea that it should raise the voice, uh, but not uh, really doing what it's supposed to do, uh, making suggestions that be active. But I call this concept now in contrast, in the very contrast to the isolationist integral neutrality, but also uh, different to the active neutrality of the 70s, because of whatever, I call this engaged neutrality. Engagement currently that means being engaged with international affairs as much possible as much as possible and staying out as much as necessary. So the sitting still is only reduced to as much as necessary and the real red line is the membership of a uh, military uh, military alliance. Uh, Neutral states could use their status uh, much more uh, than they do. Uh, and uh, that's my criticism of Austria, for example. I think a very important status to not see so that you very healthy. Um, but of course, now we have seen the emerging uh, non aligned uh, states in the global south, which have a similar status, uh, if that's are much more powerful, but uh, I think it has to be a link between the global south and uh, non alignment of the global south. Europe. So that's what it's missing, what you use now, if it times, as, a, uh, as, as I mentioned. But there can be a good model. The neutral uh, states can be a, a good uh, model, and if, uh, it was. Um, and it's under research among historians. Uh, everybody is speaking about the Stalin note in 1955 and Stalin, the first Stalin majority for Germany. There is controversies among historians whether uh, Stalin meant it seriously or 
It is not. So I am not talking about uh, this time, you know, but I am talking about something else. After 55, there was 10 years. Uh, after the Second World War, Austria was uh, united and Germany was still divided. And there, well, the idea came up from by bandits, diplomats, experts from the Western uh, part, uh, saying, well, what, what do we do about this uh, uh, German situation? And then, uh, the idea from the first one was George Cannon, so he was the former uh, American ambassador in Moscow, and he had the idea, and the other ideas were very similar, why not creating a neutral central European zone, uh, which includes would include uh, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, and Austria. So that was the Austrian. Uh, model. So others followed up. There was a bipartisan initiative in the Senate. The Noland uh, Humphrey initiative suggested the same thing. And uh, also the leader of the Labour Party, party Hugh Geitzkel, uh, suggested it. And on top of this, in '57, uh, the Polish foreign minister came up with an idea of what I learned when I talked to experts. Uh, about uh, the uh, historians about the Soviet Union. So they told me that it was a really initial, Polish initiative, which was not coordinated with the uh, Soviet Union, uh, with the, with the Kremlin. Uh, he had the idea of the, based on this central neutrality zone, this focus zone of disengagement, which included, of course, the already in uh, uh, countries, disengagement and nuclear weapon free zone. And this concept of the nuclear weapon free zone, what he developed, is still relevant for all nuclear weapon free zones. But why was Austria not here as well? Because Austria was not only neutral, Austria was a nuclear weapon free state because Austria was prohibited to have nuclear weapons, not in a neutrality law, but if a state treaty prohibited to have nuclear weapons. Different to Switzerland, different to Sweden. Switzerland and Sweden, neutral countries, they experimented with nuclear weapons until the, the, the 60s. So the threat in nuclear weapons is not completely the same as we can see now Sweden and Finland and Germany and Italy, nuclear uh, alliance. <laughs> alliance. So, uh, so we, already for that reason, I was very difficult to turn we have to change the state and not only the neutrality status, when the state will be. So it didn't work out for two reasons because we have the Cold War, of course, but because of Conrad Adenauer, the German Chancellor, so that is a Soviet poison. So I think it's only to keep him best and eventually the Oriental states might join the support. So, Austria was an export model at that time. So, jumping just an excuse on a little bit, uh, looking at this experience, but I did my own search on this uh, area, I wrote a book about the Cold War, I all this document. I wrote an article in March 3. Uh, 2014, uh, where already it was before uh, Russia uh, invaded Crimea. Uh, already, my point was looking at this historical experience, uh, my uh, suggestion was Ukraine should look uh, at the Austrian neutrality uh, law in order to avoid a war and to avoid a permanent division like Germany. So that was my uh, suggestion at that time. So permanent neutrality instead of permanent division uh, like Germany. So that was... Uh, um, I think the Foreign Minister picked this up for a couple of months uh, until October 2014. 
and dropped it. Uh, I have to say, like here three days later, so I didn't copy it from you. So it was three days later. I had a Christian check him up and said, that is another idea. And he suggested, uh, if you look as an example, not also to the three letters uh, as an example. So my piece was only published in the Austrian paper, no international paper accepted it. Of course, Kissinger was quoted, uh, not only in my papers and when I was, but I can claim, basically, I created this idea, so I thought, oh, the vision was not at the heart of a uh, Kissinger piece, because Finland was not divided, so. Finland uh, avoided the uh, uh, membership of the Russian uh, so, uh, so uh, dropped was the government that was joining the courts at the time. There was too much international pressure by NATO or others. It was maybe Ukraine itself. Uh, it, uh, so I don't really know uh, why it adopted. And I still think, still think it was, uh, would have been a relevant, uh, a relevant concept. Uh, it neutrality was not tested. And the, it was on the table in February, March, again, in Istanbul negotiations. Its, uh, negotiations failed for several uh, reasons. And uh, in fact, for the time being, Austria is an export model. It's not, uh, it's not uh, on the table anymore. But I, I, I think that it's my guess that it's very normative. Uh, sometime after the war, it might come back again, saying that no NATO membership and no Russian militias on the soil of Ukraine. Uh, basically, uh, Austria is the more that will be relevant again. Just want to remind the historians that after 1815, there was this Vienna Congress, and the Vienna Congress, uh, the Napoleonic War, there was this cooperation among big powers, and uh, it was pretty successful, so that's to avoid war uh, among the uh, European states, of course, in the middle of the century. But the uh, war finished, was unification, starting with the Crimean, Crimean War, uh, but it kept the peace until the First World War. Uh, and during this period, or well, right at the beginning of after 1815, some states uh, emerged as neutral states. Uh, so, like uh, Belgium and Switzerland, uh, neutral status were confirmed uh, by uh, this uh, uh, situation, by uh, this great uh, power cooperation. So, I'm not that pessimistic, I'm pessimistic, but I'm, it's not excluded that a couple of years after the point this might, might come back in the uh, uh, negotiating. Uh, 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 so, uh, talking about uh, neutrality, so I said, and engaged neutrality, so, uh, and as I said, uh, neutrality is not sitting still, not uh, isolating, isolationism. Uh, neutral states have to meet two conditions. One, neutral states have to be credible. And second, neutral states have to be useful. Credibility means neutral states always have to raise their voice and say, I'm not I'm going to stay neutral, I'm not going to join uh, a military alliance, I'm not going to deploy foreign troops, and I'm, uh, and I'm not going to participate uh, in foreign wars. So that's, otherwise, neutral states, most of the time, are small states. They are overlooked. So, oh, what is neutrality? So, it's happening already now. And uh, I think Austria is much too, uh, too, too low in uh, raising the voice of neutrality. I think it would fire back for Austria as well. Because they would use their visi neutral visibility more and more. Uh, I think it's an unfortunate thing. <laughs> because if you need a neutral state, you might look for somebody. As I mentioned, uh, states in the Union South. So you have to be credible. Uh, uh, and uh, in the Austrian case, but in most other cases, in the Swiss case as well, uh, the credibility is underlined by arms neutrality. So 
uh, you have to show you that your building at least to defend your territory. And Austria wouldn't have got its neutrality after 55, so I said, perception among historians uh, that Americans opposed neutrality and the Soviets uh, in imposed neutrality in Austria because it's all wrong. So uh, it was Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, who supported Austrian neutrality in contrast to his foreign minister, Dallasi. So he, he was more on the Adenauer side. So, but still, Eisenhower, uh, Eisenhower supported uh, neutrality, and in, in, in the Kremlin, there were two the factions, those who were opposed to neutrality and those who supported it. So, the Molotov faction and the Khrushchev faction supported it, and fortunately, the Austrian Chancellor Rapp negotiated with Khrushchev and not with Molotov. The Austrian Communist Party they, they basically made their own decisions and negotiated this. Molotov and dropped the uh, request for neutrality. So the uh, Communist Party dropped neutrality in 55 because, ah, the Soviets would say neutrality is not good anymore because of the German militarism. Uh, but the Austrian Chancellor talked to Khrushchev and said, you can have neutrality. And then it was when Rappen went to Moscow, uh, it was Molotov who was obliged to tell the Austrians you can be neutral. And that was the Austrian historians got wrong because they look on the situation only that Molotov told the Austrians to be neutral. So they interpret it and say, ah, the Soviets imposed it. It's entirely wrong. Khrushchev imposed it to Molotov and Molotov. <laughs> and that was an edge curse now. Uh, so uh, neutrality has to be federal. And it has to be useful, so it has to offer something. So, and powers don't care if they don't offer something. So, you can offer good offices, as the Swiss call it. Uh, you can offer good soil mediation, you can be a host of summits. Um, and uh, also, if you talk, take uh, the realist school, uh, of course, you can offer to be a buffer state. So, buffer state is, sounds a little strange, but not. In Kaffa State is uh, really important. I think that's the two things Finland and Sweden, and, and I think Ukraine could have been. Finland and Sweden, uh, the Soviet Union and Russia were very comfortable uh, with uh, Sweden and Finland as buffer states. So in Austria and Switzerland, too, we call global buffer states as well. NATO, uh, to some extent, uh, 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 I it and uh, that uh, there was a kind of barrier in the green, but still it was a buffer state between Russia and NATO countries. And this, this is uh, also something that interest states can offer. If you engage in the of course, you offer diplomatic uh, initiatives uh, as, uh, as well. And by the way, uh, there was Several studies by NATO, by uh, think tanks of the US, State Department, Defense Department of the US, there was no single study which would have a scenario that Russia would invade Finland to Sweden before uh, the trip. There was no, no, that's what I really did surprise. Because all said, okay, Russia is comfortable with buffer states. And there are plenty of studies uh, that said uh, the Baltic states are the age of Russia, the Baltic states next. But Baltic states were member states, and they were of NATO, and covered by the Article 5, so that was a mistrust to the Article 5 themselves by, uh, by, by, by uh, NATO. Um, and uh, I did my I, I study with, I was, I was already seen that I'm talking to long again. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's, it's not nice, so I mean, it's, uh, it's yep, okay, so, I will interrupt you to speak <laughs> more, you know, it's, it's still really interesting, you know, so please, go. So. Uh, I, I, I also did with my students, uh, because now in Austria we have the debate, oh, Ukraine is attacked, uh, so because it was not a member of NATO, so Austria is not a member of NATO, we should serve it. But that's a very strong debate. So, so it's one part of history. Uh, argue that way. They, they use the European Union as a pretense, uh, with European Union defense 
uh, security and defense um, you know, policies when it comes to that. Uh, is it that it would not be comfortable to say, eh, it's nonsense. Most as members of the European Union uh, is part of uh, security defense policy. Of course, it has an exception uh, of this uh, Article 427, which is a security guarantee. But I have to say, all NATO states have an exception as well. In the Lisbon Treaty, you can read twice that NATO uh, states look first, first to check whether NATO security guarantees are not better equipped for them than the European Union. So basically, all member states of the European Union have an exception of this Article 42 uh, 7. So, neutrality and uh, uh, membership of the European Union is not uh, really modern. And many in, uh, in Austria who say European Union need NATO. So that's. Uh, so that's uh, anyway. Uh, so there is this debate, you're not covered, you're not, uh, you're not protected, and they say, okay, a uh, little less dangerous and children because around the community state. Might be, but I did with my students uh, studies looking at neutral states all over the world, and it's difficult to, to uh, argue, to, to, to say this argument, but we have the data. Neutrality is a pretty good security guarantee. Neutrality is a pretty good security guarantee. So there is almost history no cases where nuclear states have been attached to neutrality has been violated, except, except in the wake of big wars. Except in the wake of big wars. So, uh, of course, there's always this example of danger. Belgium was pretty successful since uh, 1830, so 70 years. Of course, then there was the First World War, and Belgium was not the first target of China. France was the first uh, target. So it's too much to ask neutral states to prevent world wars. So if you have, of course, world wars, big powers don't take care much about the directive. Switzerland, Sweden survived, Belgium did not, uh, others in Netherlands, Denmark did not, but in peace time we only found two cases. That was Hawaii in 1895, it was swallowed by the US, and uh, it was Mexico in 1847, which was not explicitly made, but made by a neutral, behaved like a neutral uh, state. Well, better, uh, as well. Of course, we have other cases. We have Laos and Cambodia, which are very explicit neutral. But there was a Vietnam War. There was a Vietnam War, and neither the US nor the Vietnam did very clear what neutral was. War uh, aims were, of course, bigger than respect to neutrality. But, uh, but, uh, in the First World War, Britain entered the war because Belgium neutrality was violated. Not because of France, because of Belgium. So that's, so they respected uh, Austria's uh, Belgium neutrality uh, at, at that time. So, and the target are the hostile scene from the powers hostile alliances, the hostile states, not the neutral states. So, neutrality um, is a good security guarantee, but they cannot prevent uh, uh, big wars. And also, when I talked about Eisenhower, for example, there was in '56 there was this Hungarian uh, uprising, and the Soviets suspected the Austrians to host insurgents and threatened uh, Austria. And then, the, uh, Foreign Minister, even if you thought it was a uh, The Foreign Minister, uh, the spokesman, but it was, was also, I learned later, a student found a document that the National Security Council had the same, uh, discussed the same thing, so it was not open, but just a couple of months ago, a student found this document in the archives uh, that, that is really true, uh, that 
Eisenhower, der Spruchschmidt Spruch hat, der Tag, sagt, die Foster is not reality, is violated the case of a third world. So very strong words, uh, but it was underlined by this document in the uh, uh, national security uh, uh, So, and also, and another historical analogy here for a little form. Uh, before the First World War, King Edward VII, England was in Vienna and talked to Kaiser Franz Joseph and suggested to him, hey, from 1907, 1907, hey, if you, in the coming war, if you stay neutral, you can prevent the uh, World War. So why don't you stay out, declare yourself uh, neutral? And I doubt that Germany would have fought the war uh, if Austria had said no. But of course, Austria was so obsessed with Serbia at that time, so that uh, uh, so that uh, was set conditions for Serbia which was not possible to meet. So they were so obsessed uh, that uh, of course they rejected this. And we had to feel. If Austria had stayed neutral at that time and dealt with the small regional issues differently. Maybe the second world war could have been. Uh, so, uh, neutral states, credible and uh, uh, useful. Um, so, when uh, I talked about uh, um, two, two, uh, two more points, I alluded a little bit to, to, uh, to I don't quite really understand why Finland is now exchanging the status of a neutral buffer state to a frontline state. Now it is a real frontline state and seen as member from the side of Russia of a hostile uh, alliance. So there will be military built up on the border and uh, there will be can discuss it later, it's very justified. But my hunches are uh, that, um, if you look at the war in Ukraine, Russian invasion, so it was the better thing to decide. But it, and the, the war ends, so it's not this year, but the army stand. So we know this from the Korean War, we know this from the Cold War, from the Cold War, we know this from uh, Germany. So my hunch is we have a dividing line are cutting curtain coming from the Arctic Arctic through Ukraine down to the Black Sea. So that would be uh, I have in my I have to say so my prediction that uh, Ukraine could have avoided the permanent the permanent neutrality. Uh, it uh, now basically seems that uh, there are any kind of Division uh, of, of uh, government uh, in So, I mean, you will have basically the situation uh, uh, of a Korean war or German type of situation. Other talk about more soft energies like Kashmir, Cyprus, uh, that harsh uh, energies that I don't know. But nevertheless, uh, there seems to be. So we are basically back to the 50s after the Korean War. No arms control agreements anymore, no period of the uh, so, um, At that time, there were no arms control except the non proliferation treaty that's no arms control. Thank you. Uh, okay, just sorry. We have to. Uh, okay. I, fi I finish in five minutes. Okay. I finish. Okay, you will then take the mic and you the first. Yeah. I finish in five minutes. Uh, so, we are back in the 50s. And it took a long time after the Cuban Missile Crisis, there are similarities, of course, also between the Cuban Missile Crisis, the situation in Ukraine as well. And then starting slowly uh, with 
sound pumps control the very nice. Um, is there a limited test penetration to, for example? And then uh, there was in Europe there's a Hamel plan, Belgium uh, or finally it's the NATO plan. Okay, it's, yes, we have to have strong defense, but we could, should start the dialogue uh, with the Soviet Union. So that was the 60s. And it took another 10 years, almost 10 years, uh, until 75, until the Helsinki uh, final act, which was, as I mentioned, one of the post probably the post documents, best documents after the book of Europe after the Second World War, that tried to avoid this mutual threat and uh, the nuclear arms race to turn the security dilemma upside down. So not threatening each other, each other, but talking about common security and security is indivisible. And if you read the document carefully, there is no mention of security strategies today are full of these uh, terms. No mention of enemy, foe, rival, competitor, challenger, nothing but nothing, nothing like that. So of course it took a couple of years to prepare this conference from the 71, 75. As I mentioned, the non-aligned nuclear states were indispensable to set up this, uh, this conference. So when people ask me, you know, what are nuclear are for, why are they useful? So I, 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 there are many possibilities to show your usefulness. But I just mentioned the finish with that. Uh, two, two examples. First, setting up an, another CSC conference. So, it will not be Helsinki anymore, but it will be, uh, it will be another neutral state, or a state coming from the global state, coming from the global south. Global south has to be included this time, it's much more. So, there, and then, in this context, the Ukraine trade might be uh, an issue uh, again, because like after the Napoleonic War, the Vienna Congress, it's a similar uh, setting, Switzerland and uh, Belgium got its neutrality after the Vienna Congress. So, neutral states will have a role and they should seize the opportunity. I don't see that they seize So, uh, I, don't, I, I don't see that they look that far from uh, the end of the world. Second, uh, I alluded to that already. There has to be a link between Europe and the global source. So, there has to be uh, a link between neutral states. Because Finland and Sweden are members of NATO, Introduces the number of uh, neutral states in Europe, uh, but not the quality of neutral states. So, uh, and there are very few left, but they have an even more important role. Austria would have the same status nuclear, weapon free, and non aligned like most of the states, states of the global south. Nuclear, weapon free, except of course, Pakistan and India. And uh, non, non aligned. As I said, we have a that role. I don't see anybody for this role as well, but it would be important that uh, some uh, neutral states uh, would. Uh, uh, there are many other, other possibilities uh, in the Middle East, or like I said, or like state solution that possible. Uh, uh, we can discuss it, I rather stop now. Maybe specific to some discuss them. So it was exactly for if I It was one of those lectures in which you know I had like four pages and still I think that I missed quite a lot. So I'm joking a little bit, but it was really fantastic with so many data and so on. And as I told you, people like to ask here, so I think that we'll have a lot of material to uh, speak about. And uh, I saw that this is already prepared. But just let me uh, add one thing before I pass the floor. And by the way, uh, it's necessary to press it and to hold it all the time. Uh, 
uh, in order and not speak without mic because people who are uh, at Zoom will not be able to listen to. Just speaking about usefulness of us, there were two cases, probably you heard at least for one or maybe even two, in which serious negotiations have been held uh, uh, in Belgrade uh, in the last five, six years. First was the case uh, uh, dealing with Ukraine issue, uh, uh, when a high delegation of the United States of America and Russia were having uh, more or less secret negotiations. Here I know that Funko was also part of the uh, uh, Russian delegation. And another one, uh, which we heard when everything was already ended, and this was an uh, Afghanistan case, so it came out that actually uh, negotiations between the, at that time, ruling uh, structures of Afghanistan and Taliban opposition were actually held in Belgrade, and more or less it seems that the whole screenplay and scenario was prepared. So in that sense, I think that we showed uh, uh, at least willingness to accept such usefulness, but also credibility in, in many ways. Also, I know that this is about Ministry of Defense much more uh, to speak than myself, but I know that generally our structure, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also Presidency, is insisting very much in international forum that we are very much willing to take any part in peacekeeping missions uh, around the world and in that way we are trying to substitute our role in our chapter 31 and so on. But anyway, it's enough for me. Uh, Ms. Bill is a large place for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm, uh, I must say that my students adore this lesson, and it's one of the lessons we never have enough time to talk about. But I'm going to use this opportunity to just uh, get your uh, piece of advice for the Republic of Serbia. Because uh, if we summarize all that we heard, it comes to the following. Um, it is necessary for country to have diplomatic preparation in order to have um, some sort of uh, agreement with big uh, players, international players, and to have their consent to uh, go with neutrality. The second is geographical position, so it must be some sort of um, uh, internationally interesting uh, area for country to, to uh, be neutral. And I'm, talking, I'm thinking about Austria and Afghanistan. Uh, but then also, what is very important, you already talked about it, it is usefulness for, or, um, let's say, uh, momentum, momentum of international relations and uh, uh, the, the interest of uh, big powers. So having all this said, and uh, just going for what Misha already added, we have willingness to, to be neutral. We are trying to give our um, effort to the preservation of international peace. But what else do you think Serbia should do in order to have this um, agreement or uh, acceptance by the uh, main uh, international actors. Thank you. I have a good question. Maybe I didn't know uh, present enough when I mentioned that there are several types of neutrality because for me uh, self-evident. Uh, so there are a couple of more types of neutrality and one type is the Swiss and the Austrian neutrality, uh, which are called permanent neutrality, but which are based on both institutional law and international law. So these are the strongest types of neutrality, and also you mentioned uh, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is a third country uh, whose neutrality is based on international law. Very different uh, recognitions for for Switzerland after three powers of the uh, 1815 in Austria was a notification before the uh, United Nations where all uh, states which Austria had a diplomatic relations with could object, nobody object, objected to the conference of the United Nations to Afghanistan uh, and there was a decision by the General, uh, uh, general Assembly are based on international law and constitution. So a very strong 
tired of mentality. Of course, you can attend at any international relationship and do anything. And I have an international law to see can die a bit. But it's a little bit technological. And then you have the other type of mentality. And then Serbia has this type of mentality. It's a kind of self declared declared uh, mentality. So based on domestic decision, whether it's a parliamentary decision, also uh, maybe constitution, uh, the government. So, and it's pretty weak. And also uh, Sweden and Finland have the kind of neutrality based on historical traditions uh, and not based on law. But so I should have mentioned in my types, but this is uh, historical developed neutrality or safety care, but the stronger versions are this uh, and I, I don't want to tell deserves any anything, but you ask me uh, if you want to be more credible, you should move on and put it on on uh, the constitution, also at uh, trying at the United Nations to get the recognition by international law, which is a hard work, I guess. If, but by a different ways, uh, so like, like the Dodgers, Austria, and uh, Turkmenistan. But that would be a better uh, recognition for, for the neutrality status. Uh, as you said, uh, this neutral status already is used uh, in powers, uh, but uh, if it hardly was hardly recognized in the but it's not necessary. I, I also have to say, it's not, it was not in the media, we had this um, deal between the US and Iran, but a prisoner uh, exchange, and there was money frozen in South Korea, uh, which should, should be unfrozen, and uh, Switzerland later bought it for a club, it's not a money, it's in Qatar now, but it went through Switzerland. But to cut out the money. So Switzerland played a not very visible but it played an important role. So neutral states can also try to sign it. Basically, so it's for better than you. So you but, but if you have the status, the stronger status, it will be more uh, like pressure than the status. Uh, and uh, because you don't change it from one day to, to another, like three months to two. Austria, Austria, the majority of the parliament, some say you need a referendum, and you don't have to go back to the signature uh, uh, states of the state, uh, state treaty. Uh, some say that has nothing to do, but uh, it's not, not that easy. So, uh, and I, I say that an opportunity when the Ukrainian ambassador is here, but I don't want to lecture the Ukraine. But uh, I think it was uh, an opportunity to train this as well, so that they took the NATO membership in its constitution in, in, in uh, 2014. So that's not a credible credit. If they go for NATO membership, it's a different decision, it's a political decision. But if you go for neutrality, you have to be strict and clear. You want neutrality, you want to stick to neutrality, otherwise you're not credible. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, I, I saw this uh, of garbage and then uh, Professor Tetrovich and so uh microphone, Simon. Uh, okay, so I don't I don't know if it's going to be a little bit of 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 a little bit one koji sad je u kandidatu. Obzirom da pogled je 31, ima tri pakete, a od treće i Srbija i Evropska unija se čutne apsolutno nekog. Nije u meni interesuje, profesor je pomenuo, ne učeš se u drugom ratu. Šta se događa sa obavezama i statusom Austrije u slučaju da je napadnuta Evropska unija? To je prvo pitanje. Drugo je, čini se da nije vezano, Ko u Austriji definiše državni interes, a ko nacionalni i koji je dominantan? I treće pitanje je, ovaj, koja je njegova pricana, u kojoj meri je vojna neutralnost u funkciji unutrašnjih politika? Hvala. 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 Hvala
Okay, I'll do the translation. Um, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> there are three questions here. Uh, the first question is concerning the obligations of the members of the European Union, uh, given that uh, Austria participates in the common uh, foreign and uh, defense policy. Um, what, are the, what, what happens to Austria and its obligations towards the European Union in case of an attack against uh, the European Union? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, who is it that defines the national and the state interest uh, within Austria? Um, and the third question uh, was, um, I, uh, to what extent is Austrian neutrality uh, a tool uh, in the service of the internal politics uh, of Austria? Thank you. Um, yeah, the global question, uh, it's definitely a debate in, uh, in, in Austria what happens if some European Union country is attacked and uh, Austria is neutral. As I told you, there is this Article 42 7 which obliges uh, member states to come to the aid of another member state if it is attacked. So, wrongly in the debate, uh, this is confused with solidarity. There's nothing has nothing to do with solidarity. That's what she said. Moral arguments. You have to be moral in order to defend uh, other American members. It's a commitment. It's not solidarity. This Article 42.7 doesn't mention the word solidarity. The Lisbon Treaty mentions the word solidarity in two other articles. One is 222, which is an anti terrorism attack. So, in case of terrorism, member states are more or less obliged to come to the aid, not necessarily with NATO, means to the attacked states. And one is Article 2, which is a global solidarity, solidarity with the global south, and so on. So, solidarity. Article 42 so has nothing to do with But still, the question is uh, what to do. Because some international lawyers would argue, ah, it's a one sided security guarantee. All the member states of the European Union would have come to the aid to Austria, but Austria would not have come to the aid to others because they have this Irish clause. Uh, because Austria can decide, the uh, British states can decide on the basis of their own constitution. Uh, have uh, what to do. But as I said, it's also for the NATO states that they can uh, have an exception. But it's wrong. Uh, I, I think the international lawyers knows in depth interpreted it wrongly. It's a can clause, not a must clause. Austria is not forbidden to come to the aid of uh, other states. It can if it decides on the basis of its constitution. So there was this, I, I didn't mention the power into it, I think I didn't mention it here. There was this case in uh, 1915 when there was a terrorist uh, attack in, in Paris and uh, President Hollande called upon this Article 427, which I think was wrong because the Lisbon Treaty has, as I mentioned, this Article 22, which will have been the right article, but he did it nevertheless. But then Austria decided to say, okay, we send more troops to Mali in order to free of uh, French, French troops there. Yeah. The same, basically, the German. They would send also airplanes to Mali. Uh, but that was a, so it's it's not a must not it's a can so so uh, of course neutrality saves you that you are committed that you are committed to do something uh, which I think can, can be a really wrong uh, development if if there is a cyber attack and uh, somehow the European Commission decides well, they all member states have to come to the aid of the state or NATO for example. So then, uh, then you involve your entanglement. Political scientists call it entanglement. Yeah. 
or entrapment. Uh, and so I, I don't see that uh, dichotomic that the opponents of neutrality would argue and say, okay, let's only authorize a free rider and race to be protected by the this can decide itself. The other states would not, basically. Um, so, uh, the question, uh, this, uh, the, the, the second question is about the domestic, or was this the third yeah, it's domestic politics. Yeah, yeah. So, who defines state? Yeah. Okay, that, that is a decision. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to make a distinction between uh, the principle of neutrality and neutrality policy. So, and I think the principle of neutrality uh, so far is not derogated. So as long as the three conditions which I mentioned before are in place, uh, neutrality is not derogated. Of course, there are blurring lines. So uh, international lawyers are very sophisticated, especially if they want to train on neutrality. Some would argue the European Union sends weapons to Ukraine, or Austria, according to the Neutrality law, the Hague Convention of 1907, uh, is not the Austrian neutrality, but the Hague Convention is prohibited to send arms to warfighting parties. So Austria pays membership uh, fees to the European Union, the European Union sends weapons to Ukraine, so Austrian neutrality delegated the value. So you can say it's not a direct pressure to give for it. It's a trans financial trans transaction, so you have this blurring uh, lines. So, and also, if there are weapons transported through Austrian territory, uh, according to international law, the neutral states is not obliged to prevent this. But some argue Austria should uh, have to prevent it. Now, Austria would only oblige also to accept uh, weapons transfer by all the voting parties. So that would be uh, the majority. So there are all these glaring situations, and that's political decision. So it will make that's nothing to do with it, nothing, not much to do with the uh, principle of neutrality. But over time, of course, neutrality, as I said, was very flexible, adopted, adopted uh, some. Constitution amendment is uh, Article 23 J, where Austria said Austria can participate in the European Common Defense Policy uh, when it comes to peacekeeping, peace enforcement, uh, peace um, uh, arms control missions, if you can send uh, combat troops, if there's an authorization by uh, certain bodies, especially by the United uh, Nations Security Council, but also by the General Assembly, but there's some debate who can do this, but still. Uh, so, uh, the so called Petersburg task, uh, this was, uh, which I defined in this Lisbon Treaty in Article 43. And uh, so, it's a, but it's a political decision, then whether but how much you do it. So uh, that's, um, and to my mind, Austria is not really exploiting its possibility in internal political decisions, but still, the basic tenets of neutrality, if, as long as they are here. here. Uh, so it's Kreisky interpreted neutrality in a very open way, so we should do it right now. So, and the third question was the same here as. Thank you very much. You know. uh, so, Mr. Zetchich. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gartner, for your exposure. Uh, the topic is very interesting for, uh, for us in Serbia. So maybe for the future solution in Ukraine, I think uh, the Austrian example of neutrality is very attractive for uh, countries as Serbia. 
but uh, you expose some typology of neutrality. Maybe I can add something to typology. Maybe we can speak about uh, relative neutrality, relative neutrality to today. Yes, because uh, the, the Austrian is, for me, is the uh, example of relative neutrality, what, what I'm saying. Uh, Austria is a member of the European Union. Austria is participating in economic integration. Austria applied economic European laws. Austria also participated in the uh, European Councils and uh, in Trans Councils of the European Union where they are taking the decision in foreign policy. And uh, Austria also uh, uh, the Western countries supplies Austria by weapons. They, they uh, Austria bought some uh, American, Swedish, uh, French weapons. And finally, Eisenhower clearly, clearly said, if Soviet Union, if Russia attack Austria, Western country will defend Austria. And finally, I think the, the article of the, the Article 42 of the Treaty of the European Union is very clear. If so, some of the countries of the European Union are attacked, all, all the other countries, by every means that they dispose, must defend this country. If that is a clear obligation. We cannot avoid it. We can avoid it if we are not in the European Union. <laughs> it's a very clear obligation. I think it's very interesting. I think it's, but for us in Serbia, we must understand that for me it's a relative neutrality. It's practically participating in all economics and political Western um, integration process in Europe without, of course, participating, participating in NATO. Are you agree with me? <laughs> Probably not. I don't know, I may, I, I guess I may be clear, but I can't start until 47, there is this average clause. It, uh, it's clear that uh, neutral states can have the right to decide themselves whether they want to participate or not. So there is average clause. States, it doesn't call neutral states, but all states make the decision to participate in this uh, commitments. Uh, according to the constitution, the requirement is for that. So that's not, uh, so that's what this is basically an exception. My interpretation is that it doesn't prohibit uh, Austrians to participate, but uh, Austrians should not be obliged if it contradicts their own uh, constitution. constitution that uh, neutrality law is a constitution. And also, the, uh, all the other related laws. Oh, material is it, so to, the, 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 the law about uh, exports of uh, arms and the law about uh, the sending troops to foreign countries, they all have the same formula. Uh, it's, it's possible, but it has to meet the requirements of the Austrian uh, Constitution. So that's so I, I, I really don't see any contradiction between. European Union membership and uh, 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 So, if you saw some would make it up, and some argue like you, uh, but I would not accept this. I, I would also not speak about relative neutrality. As I said, you have this core of neutrality. If this put in question, then neutrality would go anywhere. Uh, I, I know this, this argument was used, was used uh, also. Uh, after uh, after Pearl Harbor by the United States, even so, the United States has been neutral uh, until Pearl Harbor anyway by themselves. So, more or less, they call it now isolation. It's a sort of type of neutrality. But in order to bring the neutral states to give up their neutrality, they said, Oh, you're not relatively neutral, you're not really neutral anymore. So, that was a political argument against the neutral states. So, but as long as the principles of neutrality are in place, there's no relative neutrality. Of course, it changed over time. We have a debate about participating in partnerships of peace and uh, all what you said, uh, that we uh, also have 
common exercises uh, with uh, my neighbor groups, three, four, uh, Austria participated in for a while. Uh, Austria had the command in Bosnia uh, of the international troops. So that's, um, that, that, that there has to be, of course, some debate, but as long as you are not commit yourself to go to war for another country, like in the uh, Article 42.7 of Article 5 of NATO, the threat is not derivated. If so, I would argue, if there are <laughs> that would be relative, <laughs> but uh, I would argue if so, if some base is on your country, but you don't have the jurisdiction about this base, like Cyprus, and there's a British uh, base there, Cyprus still can pour itself into it because it doesn't have the jurisdiction about this British American military base, like Qatar doesn't have its. Uh, jurisdiction about the American base there, which is a little bit difficult, but Moldova does the same thing about Transnistria, Moldova calls itself neutral, which is a very weak neutral state, because it's like self-declared neutrality, so it would be much more important to move on with that court, suggested for, for, for Serbia, but they don't have really the jurisdiction about Transnistria, it might change, and the, the President uh, Sanu has a clear vision what she wants. EU, yes, neutrality, yes, NATO, no. That's quite basically what, what uh, she, she has a weak neutrality, which, of course, that, uh, it should be strengthened and should be uh, respected. So, as long as that, I would not speak about it. If we talk about neutrality, relative neutrality, next day we are NATO. So, that's uh, the next, will be the next step. The opinion is not an obstacle. The opinion is not an obstacle. If you start, saying, now you're not neutral anymore, okay, uh, the day after, there's only two options, neutrality or NATO, there's nothing in between, there's nothing in between. Thanks. Uh, uh, Corey from the Institute of uh, International Work on its importance. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> except the part partnership for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. between your that, 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 that. It's not ready. No, let me. Yes, I have a question. So, I'm from the Institute of International Policy and Economics, but I'm also head of the Center for Non Graduation and Trauma and Settlement of the Professional Association of Security Director, uh, which is uh, an NGO here in Serbia. So, I'm mostly dealing with arms control issues. Uh, my question is uh, because I'm now doing on the one project uh, regarding the military neutrality and the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So, my question is about uh, the treaty. Uh, because all uh, military neutral countries in the European Union signed the treaty. So my question is, uh, should Serbia sign the treaty? We have Ireland, we have uh, Austria, we have Malta uh, that signed the treaty. We have other, like OSC and Interstate in China and the EU, but also military neutral countries in Europe, they also signed or, or signed and ratified the treaty. So what do you think about uh, that? And uh, what, what is the, the main source of that uh, uh, motivation to be the leading uh, country in the disarmament field and to, to promote the, the protection of the weapons? Thank you. So, two excellent questions. If you think you more than 45 minutes, I could respond to the NATO argument. I have to say this at this uh, partnership for peace. Partnership for peace is not membership. But there is a danger here. Yeah. Because after the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO changed uh, its um, main tasks. They have three main staff. One is collective defense, this is the security commitment. One is crisis management, one is cooperative security. So, and in all the NATO documents in the past, they were more or less equal. So, NATO states cannot participate in the first level of but cooperative security means interoperability, partnership for peace, crisis management means K4 or international operations. That's all possible. But NATO now, what NATO is doing now after the uh, Russian invasion, more or less they put the sec two second ones under the roof of the collective defense, which is very, very difficult for nuclear states. Because if you have an exercise which calls on all this glaring, but which calls itself on the basis of collective defense, 
legal here, you just just would not participate. So there have to be some exceptions to say, no, this part is cooperative security, not collective defense. So you always have to negotiate for each exercise what is collective defense and cooperative defense, and in practice, as you can tell, it is very difficult to do so. So there are lots of blurring lines. And so insofar, uh, it's getting more difficult. Uh, I agree. So that's uh, uh, second. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and that is a very good example about usefulness. So that Austria was one of the leading countries to set up this, uh, uh, this, this treaty. Uh, I was a little bit involved in the margins, um, because I, I know this main civil servants, Alexander Kmentry, was really active. And I know how, how, how it happened, it was very funny to tell you stories about it. But, um, no NATO state and no state, and no nuclear weapon state and no state allied to nuclear weapon state could have done this. Only a nuclear, non uh, nuclear weapon free state uh, could have done this. So that's the state. Of, that's one exception when Austria really seized the opportunity. But it was not so much the foreign ministry or the government, it was the civil servants. They were very active civil servants who really had a niche here because they also always say, oh, we have the arms to do perfect something. So they also host in our new uh, center, the Vela Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. So they couldn't say we are against the government, couldn't say we are against it if there comes an initiative from the from, the, from, from, from civil service. So I can, the international campaign for the operation of nuclear weapons, they claim, they invented it. That's not true. It's not true. It can it come from a group from, from civil servants who met in Brussels in the back room in a cafe and said, what do we do with the nuclear weapons? And then they came up with this idea of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. That was the start. And they moved on to the criticism of deterrence as such. Also, it came from government and not from NGOs after that. That's why I came with the Abyssal Prize, because I don't know the prize, because, because of that. It was the foreign, the people of the foreign ministry which served it. They were nominated. <laughs> you know, the Austrian foreign ministry. Yeah, but not a ministry, but this civil servant was nominated. Alexander Kmenty, at person. It's not the minister, so that was, but he was, he was the arms control person uh, of the year in the uh, arms control association. So, anyway, uh, but, uh, one correction, no uh, nuclear weapon state and no state allied to nuclear weapon state signed it. So that's, you know, in, in Europe, there are very few, only that the states you mentioned, they signed it and ratified it, it's besides the nuclear state, no maker state. So most of the signatures come from the global south in the ratification. But we do have uh, now uh, um, 70 ratifications, uh, about 70. And about 30, which signed it, it did not ratify. So there are about half of the states in the world who support it. And you could already tell, and that's very concerning, Finland and Sweden as neutral states hesitated to ratify it. So they, or Switzerland didn't sign it. So they didn't. So you can tell, okay, they have something in mind with NATO later on. And Sweden, that's what, is, what was a strong signal for me. Hey, you keep your doors open for NATO. If you sign it, you cannot join NATO. So that was a strong signal, signal for me. Uh, but long, uh, long story so short, that was an excellent example where a neutral and non neutral and non nuclear weapon states could seize the opportunity. And it's possible. It shows that it is uh, possible. Uh, also, in my uh, people who are at Zoom, if they can join us uh, as well, uh, they are. Uh, I have in mind that I see now uh, our colleague uh, Rapan as well. But I have before that to, to use uh, him because I think that he 
very, very suits him. Uh, he goes into the direction we started actually for another 45 minutes of the job that he did. The two things that are very important for us here. One is uh, 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 military conscription. Uh, Serbia has uh, had this tradition of, you know, popular army, which was very important for us. And in 2010, we have abolished them. And in the recent years, uh, I mean, generally, the public has never accepted that. In recent year, we have started again, and we are even from the, from the very high levels, Minister of Defense, and President himself has openly spoken, spoken a, a, about the possibility for the time being. Of course, they are using some other premises to avoid that, but in many ways, there is ongoing idea that uh, we have to somehow get it back. And the case of Austria, which returned that very recently, is very interesting for us. So my question is one, uh, uh, would you comment about that, why Austria uh, returned that, and uh, is it necessary in today's idea on, on neutrality, of okay, that you have to protect yourself? And another one, of course, very tricky one for us is Bosnia-Herzegovina, because it's that, that, which is, I don't know how it shall, if we could put it in any terms, but uh, generally it serves and Serbia also is very interested in Bosnia-Herzegovina staying out of NATO military alliances and in some way uh, having neutrality, which of course is not very uh, accepted by our Bosnian friends and so on, but could you comment about uh, this position maybe also in Bosnia as a buffer zone and whatsoever? I mean, very tricky ones, but um, I would be very happy to know about those two issues. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the construction the question, as in principle, as in, in principle, there has not much to do with uh, the status of uh, neutrality, so you can have either one. Austria had a referendum and at some point to switch from the conscription army to professional army. And it was uh, rejected, uh, uh, but there was uh, also in the elites uh, there were there is much doubts for Austria. And Austria actually, and I would, Austria was very proud uh, that because of this conscription status, that the military is integrated in the population, and you do have exercise. They reduced it. I, I think it was not such a good idea. But there has continuous exercises. And people leave the work and go back. I have a couple of weeks exercise and go back. So they're in the, in the population. Uh, so because it was reduced at a time, some politicians of the time was rejected. But Austria. Uh, uh, one is a plan for the Austrian defense plan, which was renewed uh, every couple of uh, years, but this one goes back to the 70s, and has a very recent, uh, recent uh, foresight uh, about what uh, uh, defense of Austria should be. The defense plan is saying. Defense should not only be military, but also economic uh, and uh, in intellectual uh, and uh, civ civilian. So this is the, so later on academics came with the idea with Barry Busan, the Copenhagen School. Um, Fifteen years later came up with the idea of comprehensive security. That was the Austrian defense plan that already in the 70s. So if you have a professional army, Cover all these four dimensions anymore. So that's why the military is said, uh, okay, but no, we're not that happy because what do we do with all the other dimensions? If you have a professional army, you will have to integrate the population in intellectual defense. So I would not, would not to do, I'm, I'm, I'm chairing uh, a council of the strategic, strategic, strategy and security of the Austrian uh, uh, Science Commission, um, the Science Commission of the Austrian Armed Forces, I could not do so if there were not the dimension of, dimension of uh, intellectual defense. 
So I have a little bit more for me, so because of course I did my service in the military, I was gone. So uh, I've intellectually made things in which you involve civil society, you get scientists, and uh, so that that's, would not be compatible really with, uh, with a professional. Okay. professional. Uh, um, I don't have much to say with regard to the second question, but in general, um, I would say that priority should be. I don't see any priority for it, for, for, but it's up to them to, to decide. Uh, but um, I even see an advantage, as I said, for other states. Um, um, I was not sure when Montenegro made such a I think it was not necessary. NATO would be Montenegro anyway. Trump, President Trump, made it very clear. And he said, well, why should NATO defend Montenegro? That's what he said. So, uh, but for me, Montenegro, it's I think, an important decision to come to the aid if, uh, if, if, if there is somebody here. Uh, so that's. Uh, for them, for NATO, it's so your opinion, I think, should be a priority for its uh, countries. And I, I don't want to lecture you, but I also think so. Sorry. Uh, so much. Okay. Um, that is, which is not really related, but I want to say this here. So, but I want to say this. Uh, I, I, the idea of neutrality is there. So, in the European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, it has every two years a survey about threat perceptions. And that's, it's a very transatlantic uh, same thing. And they asked the European Union members, as the states, the citizens of the European Union, uh, what would you do if there's a conflict between China and the US? They didn't even ask military conflict. So it was a conflict this year then to Taiwan. Did I mention this year? No, no, no. Uh, 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 and you all have to. I want to repeat myself. What would you do? Which which wing, which uh, which which side would you uh, which country which which power would you side uh, in this polarization? So very few is China, of course. But 60 to 65 percent uh, would say they are stay neutral because they don't want to be involved, entangled, or interact in a foreign uh, military conflict or, or conflict, which I think is rational. And if you look at the latest NATO documents, they include China already in Article 5. So that's it's, it's very much uh, forgotten because if there's a hybrid for a cyber attack, the NATO Council could decide on Article 5 that that's an, uh, an, it's an attack on a member state. So you might be involved. Who can read these pictures? They really can, except the Americans. So <laughs> nobody can really tell whether it's true or not. So you don't have to read the most of the countries don't have to read the support. So neutrality is. Is still in the mind uh, of many states, even for citizens. Uh, and uh, so I would not discard this from, by the way, either NATO, yeah, of course, polarization, big powers, all this is the idea, is the resource against us. Yeah? To stay out of the so that was think, thinking in blocks blocks of thinking. <laughs> Uh, uh, our colleague also commits to for international politics and economics. Yes, thank you. So, my name is Vladimir Kapak from International Politics and Economics. And I got a question or a rather small comment, a comment regarding Ukraine. Uh, you said that uh, Ukraine could have averted the war with Russia and permanent division of its territory had it accepted neutrality. Yet I have uh, at least two problems uh, with this point. Uh, the first one is that Ukraine actually was neutral. It, uh, during President Yanukovych, returned to non-bloc status. And I will remind you that the first Ukrainian crisis erupted not because Ukraine uh, decided to abandon neutrality and join NATO, 
but because they decided to sign an association agreement with the EU. And then uh, Russia blackmailed Yanukovych not to sign it, and we know what happened afterwards. And why Russia did that? Because uh, uh, the signing of this agreement would prevent Ukraine uh, from joining a Russia-led Eurasian economic union. So Russia wanted Ukraine to, to become part of its union, and uh, de facto its sphere of influence. And then we come to the second uh, problem with this, Yes, I agree with you that Ukraine could have averted a uh, division and war, but uh, what would be cost of it? Uh, would it uh, remain a sovereign country? No, it, it would become a Russian battle, a Russian puppet state like Belarus, some kind of Belarus number two, and this is what Russia wanted from uh, the very beginning of Ukraine, so it couldn't become, uh, it couldn't remain neutral if it becomes for us. Um, so, yes, of course, we have to speak counterfactual now, so because we uh, don't really know what happened when uh, in this other case. Um, no, I don't agree that uh, uh, Ukraine was uh, in the so, uh, latest of 2008, I mean, you could hear that uh, Ukraine is driving for NATO. Of course, it was an oscillation, oscillation always forth and back. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine said no, but then 2014, and, and then uh, Ukraine uh, deleted uh, this word neutrality from the Constitution and replaced it with NATO membership in 2014. So, of course, I agree it was after the year uh, in the prevention of the it was before February 2023, so, uh, uh, sorry, 22, no, 22, yeah. Uh, it was, so, uh, Ukraine was not, that's why I expressed so much the credibility here. It was, non-NATO membership does not really mean uh, neutrality. Of course, Russia always said non-NATO membership, but Russia almost never said neutrality. Because neutrality would have meant uh, that they have to withdraw their militias from the East as well. You don't have to have uh, for, foreign troops or uh, militias related to foreign troops in your territory, if you know. So the Russians meant, okay, NATO should do something, it's not staying out, but we don't do anything. So Ukraine's position would have weakened if they only had said no NATO membership by the but if they had said neutrality, right, uh, Ukraine's position would have been strengthened. So a, a, a real, a real uh, neutral state. I don't buy this argument about uh, European the contradiction between European and the Eurasian economic uh, union. And to some extent, the European Union is to blame as well, because they thought that that was mutually exclusive. In Asia, you have all kinds of mutual trade agreements and associations which are over there. You can have over there trade. So and then the European Union also said with us or against us. So that uh, was was what was an issue. But I don't think that the European Union was for Russia the issue. If you listen to the speech by Putin in 2007 in the Munich Security Conference, in the Q A uh, period, there is um, um, Putin said Okay, if Ukraine is a member of the European Union, we have to settle the energy issue. So, he, he, in this speech, he spoke very much against NATO expansion, the 2007 speech. So that was a sign of a warning. But he, about the European Union and the current day, he said, okay, fine, we have to uh, the settle the energy issue. So, he was not uh, really against the European Union. It was played up in the negotiations. Uh, of course, the Yanukovych was to blame as well, but the European Union, the thought it was mutually exclusive. So I don't think the European that, 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 that Russia would have gone along with the European All what I'm saying, I cannot move. I cannot move because it was desperate. <laughs> but I think, and the Belarus, I think Ukraine would have had a Finnish status. Finnish status is a policy. That would be. Uh, in the situation, I'm not sure that it's 
Frau Kospela was a very difficult situation. Yeah, uh, Lukashenko also wanted to get some home of maneuver. They called them the situation, situation uh, which were so terrible. So Lukashenko had in mind, I, I don't know what he knows, but listening to his speeches, he just doesn't have so much room of maneuver. He wanted something like this, something like Tito. So Tito was basically his model, uh, but Tito was different personality, and Tito was farther away from Moscow, and Tito had recognized uh, this uh, much more than I was. But it was not successful, and still, still I participated lately in a conference in uh, as well, and I still have the feeling they are not happy, even the elite in uh, Belarus. So I, I live alone with uh, Lukashenko. They are not happy with the status. They are not happy that the Russians are deploying uh, nuclear weapons on their soil. So, uh, but we are not successful. You are correct. It can happen either way. But I rather would say Finland could be the result of not Belarus. Uh, anyway, since we've been working for two hours already, and before that, uh, 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 Professor had the uh, podcast, the uh, severe torture here to the Atlas, and I think it's about the time that you are sorry, Mr. Uh, time that you wanted. Uh, yeah, basically. Very patient. Professor, it was a great pleasure hearing from you today. Thank you very much for your comprehensive. Presentation and very useful uh, comments and, uh, and but at the end, I'm seeing that we are we are advancing to the end of this joyful uh, meeting today. Just to 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 ask you kindly for the comment, for example, uh, that Serbia today is facing a strong pressure on our decision on military neutrality. We're facing that every day, and the the, the most visible argument is that uh, uh, seeing and uh, uh, I say, listening to the arguments of the Finland and Sweden, they try to convince us that their neutrality was useless. How do you comment that? Uh, no, I, I, I would say if Um, there was no attack on the neutrality. That was a domestic decision that they made. There was no... Of course, there have been elites uh, who asked for NATO membership for a long time. So it's hard to uh, in, in, in Sweden and for it is now uh, uh, in, in Finland. So that, uh, and this is the opportunity of the attack of uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine. And um, so I didn't, I didn't see any change in the real geopolitical status in Finland or as uh, uh, we. I see now, I see definitely now uh, the Finland status, also Sweden status, uh, will change in the uh, time to come. Um, and uh, of course, in times of war and in times of strong polarization, there's always a strong uh, pressure on the neutral states. And, uh, and if it goes back to the Peloponnesian War, there's a historical example of the island Melos, uh, and they uh, wanted to be neutral, but they said, we don't want to be any party with. Uh, as, uh, Enemy with anybody, so uh, but we don't uh, uh, want to uh, uh, participate in, in hostile uh, actions of somebody. So that was for the best things, that was not enough to crash uh, because of that whenever you have a big war, uh, neutral states are in, in danger. So neutral states should have a big interest to avoid a big war because. Uh, then they are in danger, but as long as there is only quotation mark polarization, they have a role to avoid it. And then I do think Serbia has a role, like Austria would have a role, in Finland and Sweden would have had this role, 
and uh, all the other states which are not entangled in military alliances. Once you are entangled in military alliances, you have very, very little room for funding. Uh, if you go back, if, is, it, is it a wrong perception? Is it a wrong perception when I hear always that neutral states were a part of the Cold War and now the Cold War is over and not have no The opposite was true. The Cold War hyperreality was about blocks and neutral states tried to stay out of the blocks. There were the anomaly, there were the exceptions. So if you have the pressure now, of course there's a pressure, you have to join any you have to withstand the pressure, you have to try to be the exemption that somebody has to uh, take a role outside of the blocks. So um, that's, um, you have the pressure, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's not comfortable, uh, but um, of course, the, if you look at the history, Neutral states disappear because of this pressure and new ones emerge and take over this all. So if you during the wars, some stay neutral, after the war they give up until the new ones uh, emerge, and after the second world war, Finland and Sweden, uh, Finland and Austria emerge, Finland and Sweden disappeared now, the global south is emerging now. Uh, I, I do see a role uh, for Serbia, as you mentioned, the examples, there can be more examples, but Serbia plays a very useful role, uh, like Austria should be. So if you give in, of course, you're just a, a member of uh, the alliance, like Finland and Sweden. So then you're just a small member. You don't have, don't have much influence anymore, anyway. So that's, of course, you sit in the NATO Council, uh, but uh, you know that the decisions are made. It comes to big decisions. Everybody knows. If you are outside, you have a little more room of memory. So, pressure is not an argument to be found in the toilet. Just a small comment to add, if I can, from the personal experience in uh, March 2016, when there used to be a previous wave of pressure on Finland in Sweden, I was there for 10 days and I got the chance to speak with colleagues in. Alexander Institute uh, in, in uh, Finland, and they told me at that moment, well, they are trying to push us, 70% of people are very strong against that. We have 1,360 kilometers with Russia, only 5 million of us, then decide that if we join the NATO, we and Sweden are supposed to be the first line of defense of the Baltic states in the fight. So there is no any chance that we see any interest in leaving neutrality. Still, five, six years ago, in a way, they were forced there. So it was very interesting experience. Anyway, I really deeply want to thank you. I personally enjoyed that and I'm not speaking only on my personal behalf. Thank you very much for all for being with us. Thank you very much, Professor. And I can finish with that, but I can tell you, promise you, once I become president, I would have to ask you as an advisor for <laughs> our neutrality issues. Uh, I'm available. Okay, <laughs> then I'm going to do something about it. Joking aside.